I'm, I'm here to have a short working trip because uh, this year will mark the 25th anniversary of the Hong Kong handover. So I want to push something uh, for Hong Kong uh, using this uh, opportunity yeah, because everyone of us know that uh, under the Sino-British Joint Declaration, we were guaranteed with at least 50 years of autonomy, civil liberties, judiciary system and so on. But even before hitting such a milestone, we have lost almost everything. So this is a good window uh, to push for something yeah, for maybe for a long run as well. So what I'm thinking of is try to set up a different parliamentary group uh, in different national parliaments. For example, Sweden, Switzerland, and then uh, Belgium and many different countries. And then the reason why I came to uh, Sweden is that I think Sweden uh, is the frequent victim, frequent victim of the uh, of Chinese bullying. Yeah, no matter whether it's related to the press freedom or the kidnap of uh, Guaman High and other many many other uh, incidents. So that's why I think it could be a great breakthrough uh, even among the EU member states. Yeah, so yeah, so in short, this is my purpose of visiting. Mm. And what were your expectations going in when you visited Sweden? My expectation is that I uh, hopefully uh, maybe after the September election, then we could launch uh, the parliamentary group on Hong Kong. If we has some kind of uh, vehicle uh, inside the parliament, if we could gather a group of uh, MPs that is supportive towards the democracy of Hong Kong, uh, then we could maybe relatively easy to maintain the momentum and push for uh, any motions that related to Hong Kong and uh, anti-Chinese Communist Party. So this is my expectation. And maybe uh, on the first day of, uh, on the first of July, then perhaps we could expect some kind of statement from different MPs. There is some, I would say this is the least thing that we should aim for or yeah, expect. And uh, when you met the MPs, what were your impressions of their views? Well, in general, uh, actually not in general, actually all of them are very, very supportive. Yeah. So I have met uh, more than a uh, dozen of MPs and all of them comes from different political spectrum, different political parties, including the ruling, ruling party. So um, that's why I'm quite um, positive or optimistic towards, uh, towards the future of efficacy work in Sweden. And I believe that I will come back quite, quite often because uh, some of the MP, they suggest to have a seminar on the metro system in Stockholm because all of us know that uh, we are giving all our money to MTR again in Stockholm and then this is something that is uh, quite close uh, closely related to the national interest uh, of of the Swedish people yeah. and then on the other hand we are also reading some news related to the uh, Alanda airport because uh, two months ago, uh, they awarded a contract to a Chinese company uh, which provided uh, screening equipment uh, to the airport. And this company has been banned by the US government since 2014. They, uh, they will send all in passenger information to Beijing. So, this, so that's why uh, it's quite important to urgently review the public procurement procedures and relevant laws and regulations related to, to that. And this is also a critical timing uh, to reduce the dependency on the Chinese market. If we could reduce the Chinese dependency, uh, then we could bit by bit or gradually untie our hands to deploy more diplomatic tools and to secure or the security and the supply chain of Sweden and even maybe other EU member states. Mm -hmm. And you met with a, like a variety of different parties, didn't you? Uh, right. Um, did you find any major differences when it came to views and approaches to the, let's call it the China problem? Well, maybe because uh, what I have met so far are, are those very supportive towards Hong Kong. I don't see any key difference among them. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe because uh, this is a consensus that uh, the, ch the PRC yeah, is, a, is a gigantic or assertive uh, regime that is yeah, trying 
to strong arm many different countries. That's why uh, we got a very high level of consensus among different po- politicians. Yeah, maybe not not among politicians, but among all the Swedish citizens. Yeah, because all of them could read from the news. Uh, they could read about the ridiculous metaphor of 40 kilogram bosses versus 66 kilogram heavyweight bosses. This sort of a ridiculous metaphor. Mm-hmm. And this has aroused many a high level of uh, discontent or hatred mm-hmm. or anger yeah, towards the, the Chinese government. Okay. Now let's get a little bit into your experiences in the UK. You can tell us about when you first got to the UK and how that happened. Well, my, my, my experience or my path is a little bit different from other people because, well, maybe I could uh, talk about a little bit of my background first. So back in 2015, I was graduated in Hong Kong and then I worked in Hong Kong for two years as a surveyor. And then once I got my UK chartership, then I relocated from Hong Kong to Singapore for one and a half year. At that time, I didn't plan to migrate or immigrate to, to Singapore to become a Singapore, Singaporean. Well, the reason why I relocate there is that I want to live and work there to compare Hong Kong and Singapore. People always compare both cities or both countries. So that's why I think it's rather better for me to experience and compare by myself with my own eyes, with my, yeah, with my own eyes. So, and then all of a sudden I, in, I got the invitation to relocate to the UK. So two months before the one million march uh, in Hong Kong happened, then uh, I relocated to London. And on that day, on, on, on 9th of June, I was uh, sen- standing outside the Chinese embassy in London. I was also protesting outside the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office. So, well, on, on that occasion, I think that there must be something more that we could do. Uh, that is uh, the sanctioning ideas that I could talk, it, talk about it later on. And then uh, there were so many things happened in, back in 2019 and then 2020. It ended up that uh, in September 2019, I was, my teams and I, we were condemned by the Beijing government uh, in a special press conference. Since then, I know I'm one of the top tier target of the party. And then uh, in year 2020, I was uh, arrested and detained uh, for more than 50 hours. But then because they didn't know my identity at that time, so they uh, still really <laughs> re- re- released me after, after 50 hours. And then I flew back to London. So However, the story didn't end there, but because uh, five months later, I was attacked by, by them in London, near my house, during the lockdown period. And then uh, two months after the attack, uh, I was officially wounded by the CCP. So that's how uh, I ended up being in exile uh, in the UK. So since August 2020, yeah, I'm formally in exile. Hmm. And in your activism, and your time in the UK, what were the, some of the major difficulties you faced there in trying to spread awareness or trying to um, prompt action? Yeah, so um, recently I am thinking the meaning of activism and efficacy. So maybe between activism and efficacy, I will always choose the later one. The latter one. Because uh, efficacy it means some kind of uh, political uh, efficacy works that could hit maybe the heart of politician, such that they could uh, push for some policy that is favorable to the national interest as well as uh, the human rights, and autonomy and democracy of Hong Kong. So I'm trying to find that mutual interest. So on the other hand, uh, I all also want to engage with, uh, with different community such as uh, the pe- for those people who live in Sweden, for those people who live in the UK, Switzerland, and even Belgium. Yeah. Because I think if there is no interaction between uh, community and myself, then I will lose the touch or lose the sense uh, gradually, and I won't, don't want that to happen. So that's why uh, I am going to organize different uh, events. Yeah that's on the ground, for example, cultural exhibition uh, on June 12th. 
and uh, I'm discussing with uh, different cities uh, that the, on the possibility that we could share the materials, exhibition materials, uh, and then to engage uh, with more local people, for example, local British, local Swedish, local Americans, and, and so on. Yeah. So this is the way that uh, I want to work. And I don't think this sort of thing is activism. Rather, I would say this is a groundwork. So I would define myself as an advocate and some kind of people who would do groundwork. All right. And how difficult do you think it would be to arrange these sort of events in a country like Sweden, perhaps? Hmm. Well, uh, just now we, we had a very short uh, discussion yeah, on on the Facebook group. Is it Facebook group? Uh, yeah, yeah in, in Sweden. So I know that uh, actually it is not, not a single case. Uh, it's, uh, it's applicable to many different countries like Australia, UK and US. So on Facebook, we may have a large group of Hong Kongers. So for example, something like Hong Kongers in Sweden. But quite often, uh, the owner, yeah, or maybe uh, the admin of those groups, are blue. Yeah, they are quite pro Beijing, uh, anti democracy, and the human rights. These sorts of people. So all, quite often, we have to censor ourselves uh, in those groups, and this is not a good way to um, integrate with uh, a democratic society. Yeah. If we cannot say anything, uh, we if we cannot enjoy free speech, even though we are in a democratic country like Sweden, then I don't think is quite. I, I don't feel the difference between uh, being in Sweden or being in Hong Kong. So rather, maybe we could consider setting up some kind of a uh, Facebook group by uh, like-minded people who support Hong Kong democracy, such that we could get uh, at least some kind of virtual civic space. To talk about what we want to share, the news that we care about. Yeah, this is the first step. And if we could get a group of people, uh, a group of such a community, then we could create more opportunities. Uh, we could create more synergy. Uh, e maybe even with the with the politician, we could organize more exhibition based on that group. Yeah. So this is something that I'm also thinking. Of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you're forming these communities, how much of a concern is it, have you found, um, that, that these groups might be uh, infiltrated, if that doesn't sound too dramatic, by pro-CCP uh, agents? Well, I would say that 100% they will infiltrate. <laughs> yeah, 100% they will do that. Yeah. But I don't think this should be an issue. After all, they could spy on on the news that we share, but it doesn't mean that uh, uh, we should not talk talk about it. And on the other hand, we may from time to time uh, organize different uh, gatherings, and by this sorts of face-to-face uh, -face, uh, interaction, we will know who are really our friends. Yeah, who, who, yeah. So that's why I don't think that we should. Uh, we strain ourselves because of the fear of being infiltrated. Yeah. So rather, um, and on the other hand, sometimes I think I even think that we should enlarge our support supporting base. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Supporter base. For example, we should uh, turn those light blue people into light yellow, or maybe slightly closer to to a neutral uh, state. Yeah. So this may be one of the way that we could try to turn them into such a people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but because if we keep staying in those groups that could not, uh, in which we could not freely express our opinion, then people may get used to such a state, and bit by bit we may become uh, relatively blue. <laughs> yeah. Maybe after after ten years, yeah. mm -hmm. and I don't want to see the same being replicated or repeated. Mm -hmm. Is there a way uh, that you see that people could help without necessarily uh, uh, putting their privacy or their identity in danger? Uh, you mean joining such a group? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we, we, we could think of some maybe a basic level of maybe basic screening. Yeah. So this is the least thing that we should do. Mm. At least make it a private group or whatsoever. Yeah. By then we could provide some kind of uh, 
minimum level of security. Yeah, but to be honest, uh, we don't have any ways of uh, counter the infiltration because we are not a MI5, we are not a CIA, FBI. We can't do security check, background check on every people. And if any organization do that, uh, this sort of security check or background check, then I would, I'm sure that it will scare all the people and it's rather dangerous for any organization or entity to hold this sort of information. So we have to strike a balance. Right. So one of the, the uh, biggest problems we have in Sweden that I found anyway, is that whenever we want to hold some sort of event, it's difficult to draw attention to it when Hong Kong is already in the news. So what were some of the most successful tactics you used to draw attention to the movement? Well, I have discussed this with my friends in, in Washington DC before. So, well, he is a staffer of, of, of congressmen, yeah, that is the, the US MP. Yeah. Then one of the tactics or one of the skill that he suggests to me or taught me is that you have to tell your personal story. Is is something that related to your own experience. For example, uh, is, is, it could be nothing dramatic like what I've experienced, like being arrested or detained in the police station, how I was attacked. It could be something very personal, like how you were being bullied uh, in the campus by some uh, so-called little pinkies, uh, those Chinese students that is uh, controlled by uh, that are controlled by the Chinese embassy, or maybe what you have witnessed uh, in Hong Kong when you were in Hong Kong, say 2019. Uh, this is some sort of uh, of things that we could make use of, yeah. Because uh, all is it is the personal story that could always touch the people. Uh, so I would suggest that everyone try to tell your own story, and then uh, sometimes because you may you may just tell the Hong Kong story to many different people, like your friends, your community members. You don't need to talk about a very a hardcore statistic like uh, say we have uh, X percentage of, uh, of blah 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 Y percentage of uh, blah 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 this sort of uh, thing <laughs> we could just have some kind of soft touch mm-hmm. yeah, on your personal story on your personal feel on the democracy of Hong Kong and other things and this is the most efficient way and easiest way to convince people okay uh, so, what is your advice for Hong Kongers here in Sweden who may want to get involved in the movement and you know get something going? Mm. Uh, for for the last few days, uh, I have been in touch with different Hong Kong diaspora groups, no matter in Stockholm or today here, uh, with all of you. And then some of the feedback or opinions that I heard heard is that. Uh, we sometimes we don't have any enough people to drive in to drive some activities to steer some activities or to steer an organization. So, uh, for example, another organization is looking for volunteers or new core from the University of Stockholm. Yeah, so this is something that uh, so they represent or implies the importance of having some kind of new blood to join a uh, different uh, organization. Because without people, without uh, without people, then it's impossible for us to organize anti activities, and people would get burned out if we always rely on the same group of people. And from time to time, we have to, if some new people join a team, then maybe some kind of fresh uh, thinking or thought could be brought into that organization. So uh, for any people who wants to support Hong Kong, who wants to preserve the language, culture, and history of Hong Kong, then I would suggest uh, those people to join different uh, uh, organizations. For example, uh, Bohemian Freedom, yeah, and then uh, another yeah, group. Hmm. Um, and your opinion, where should the movement's primary focus be? The primary focus well, I, well, this is a tough question because 
the primary focus or the ultimate goal will be to free Hong Kong. <laughs> but there are so many things that we have to do. So in my mind, say uh, there may be eight items or eight areas that we should work on. For example, media, history, language, and other many different areas that we should work on. So it's hard to say what is uh, the most important works. But I would say that uh, in essence, we have to at least preserve our identity and how to preserve our identity that is to preserve our language culture and history and how to preserve our language culture and history that is to organize different uh, events like cultural exhibition like uh, organizing screening activity like revolution of our times like uh, organizing this different sorts of maybe you could call it cultural or soft power events Mm -hmm. you know, or maybe even we could organize some kind of classes to teach Cantonese among ourselves. Because I, I heard that for the second, re second generation or third generation of uh, Swedish Hong Kongers, uh, or Hong Kongers Swedish, yeah, one of the struggle is that the younger generation uh, of diaspora group, they may not be willing to speak Cantonese, and without language, then they a di diaspora group would vanish in the end, would disappear in the end. So that's why we have to preserve our language, history, and yeah, mm. and culture. Fantastic. And um, my last question: From what you have experienced um, as an advocate, what do you feel are the core skills needed? You mean myself or, or, or Hong Kong? Or uh, yeah, uh, anyone wanting to join the movement, anyone? Mm. Or what do you think the movement is lacking in terms, in terms of skill, if there's anything? Snacking. Well, I would say we have so many shortcomings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, well, the, the advantage is that our advantage is that we got the creativity. For example, back in 2019, we have done so many things like uh, Lenin War, uh, we also use, we also use uh, technology like Telegram, uh, online forum, uh, even newspapers and many different ways or even Twitter yeah, to engage with the international community to push for Hong Kong uh, human rights and autonomy. So this is our advantage. But on the other hand, uh, it is always so difficult to sustain or to uh, to continue the fight. Yeah. But one of the things that I think Hong Kongers is getting better and better is that we are becoming more and more resilient. So if we look into the recent years of history of Hong Kong, uh, we got the, the first uh, large scale protest back in 2003. We got half a million people marching in Hong Kong. And then the next time we got a protest, large scale protest was 2014. And then the next uh, key event would be the 2016 uh, fish, fishbowl revolution. And then three years after the fishbowl revolution, we got the uh, revolution of our times yeah, in 2019 to 2020. So it shows that uh, we are more and more resilient. Perhaps we may witness another uprising in Hong Kong. I don't know for how long, maybe in five years or maybe in ten years. Yeah, I hope that may happen uh, yeah, in the near future. And I hope that we could be successful. And how to be successful uh, in the next uh, uprising is that we have to learn from 2019. We have to improve our supply chain. We have to gather more financial resources. We have to improve our communication method among the protesters. Uh, so this is what we need to prepare for. And right now we are in the stage of uh, regrouping, reconsolidating uh, our power uh, and our resources. Yeah. So uh, we have to think about the shortcoming of a totally leaderless model. And on the other hand, we have to think about the problem of an over-centralized model. Perhaps we could combine the advantage uh, of both into one. Uh, maybe we could on a, working on a project basis with a lead, leading coordinator on each project and then after finishing the project we will disperse the group. 
and then for another project we will come together again so this is maybe one of the model that we could think about so unity is always uh, the big problem that we need to tackle and in terms of skill sets uh, well I would say there there are so many skill sets that we have to preserve or maintain it could be professional practice or how we um, practice in, in the business world, for example, uh, in the banking sector, in the medical sector, uh, in the marketing sector, and so on. We have to live our life. So not everyone is advocate, so we have to uh, earn a living as well. But while earning a living, uh, we should climb the social, so-called social ladder to maybe to a position that is more inferential, uh, to a position that uh, other people will be much more willing to listen to you. So one of the things that I have been thinking of is, is the possibility of setting up a, an institution uh, for different construction professionals. Yeah. This is not really not just uh, restrictive to the construction professional, perhaps for other sectors. For example, for the marketing sector, they may think about setting up an international uh, Hong Kong Association of Marketing and then International Association of Nursing and many different institutions. And this is one of the ways that we could uh, gather and preserve our uh, our influence and our resources. Mm. And um, for those smaller um, organizations like our own, how important do you think it is that we connect with with uh, groups such as IPAC? Like, how effective do you believe that those associations are? Well, uh, IPAC is well. To those people who may know what IPAD is, IPAD stands for Interparliamentary Alliance on China. So it, is, it consists of uh, hundreds of uh, parliamentarians uh, around the world. So I would say it's very, very important to engage with organizations like that, or even maybe other, in, other uh, international civil society organizations or international NGOs like Amnesty International. Because right now we don't have uh, any press freedom in Hong Kong. Uh, so it is important to keep or maintain uh, a minimum level of awareness on Hong Kong issue. And by engaging with these organizations or entity is a way, good way. And for in the case of iPad, well, because in, in democracy, so in many democratic countries, we, they, they, consist, they, they, they follow the, the principle of a separate, separation of power. So whenever we want to push for a government to do something, uh, it is quite important to push or try to encourage uh, different par- par- parliamentarians to pressure their own government. Yeah. So this is uh, all. On the other hand, we could do some kind of civil society works to e- to impose pressure on the government as well. So I would say these are the two channels that we could uh, leverage. Uh, that we could. Uh, encourage different governments to change their foreign policy uh, towards China and Hong Kong. Yeah, so that's why it's very important. Hmm. Anyone else have any questions? No. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that surprised you about, um, about the Hong Kong groups or the Hong Kong diaspora communities that you've encountered? Surprise me in any way. Uh, some of no, maybe one of the things that surprised me is, is that there must be Hong Kongers in in many towns or can or, or cities, no matter how remote it is. Mm. <laughs> so so sometimes when I when I travel to a remote city, then I was amazed by the fact that there mm. are some Hong Kongers living there. For example, uh, maybe I'm, I'm not visiting those uh, cities, but when I watch some YouTube video or maybe some TV program, they will talk about the diaspora Hong Kong yeah, in the country. For example, uh, there may be some Hong Konger in Gibraltar mm-hmm. or maybe uh, in, in some African countries or maybe in some Latin American countries. And this is something that uh, amazed me. And surprise me, yeah. But in terms of other things, because I'm also part of the diaspora group, yeah. 
and I have experienced a lot, so I don't think there are so many things that surprise me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't hold myself when I had my back turned. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Does anyone have any comments? Or? It, it could be in Cantonese. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, please talk Cantonese. Yes. <laughs> If we're gonna start some community-based networking building event, let's say, what do you think we should include? Mm, maybe the first one is barbecue in summertime. I'm I'm serious. Although it sounds funny, because. Well, I think this sort of uh, um, community event is quite, uh, well, how to say, happy, you know, yeah. funny to do. Yeah. And sometimes you don't need to do something so hardcore or so serious. Because I don't think it's uh, sustainable to do something that is quite uh, heavy you know, or too, mm, too, too serious. For example, you, you need not to keep watching Revolution of Times every one, every one <laughs> and this sort of thing yeah. so rather I will suggest maybe we could do something more casual first and then from time to time if uh, there is a group of people maybe three or four people three to four people then they think that there's a potential to do something more cultural or more more cultural then we could do that it could be exhibition it could be even having a uh, a booth yeah, in a Sunday market or summer market, selling Hong Kong food or these sorts of things. Yeah, so this is something that uh, we could uh, preserve our identity. So I always think from the perspective of how to preserve our identity. Yeah. Can we share our identity? Sure. Yeah, because we were talking a few hours ago, not too long ago. So we're thinking it's like, because we had the Buddhist community in Melbourne. When we were and people were asking that we have like more community based events, including like some language cafe, like Cantonese uh, cafe or something like that, a place for people to speak about Cantonese, to talk about Cantonese and perhaps learn Cantonese. And then what I want more is like, because I'm really, something I really hate about Sweden is like, when I, whenever I need to apply for certain application on the government, I always need to write down Chinese, not Hong Kong. I really hate that. Mm. And then, because I was thinking maybe we can start something collaborating with people or we do it ourselves. We have like a perhaps cafe, at least with Maui staff, uh, Maui municipality. And then we can have like a cultural event with different kind of like a pop up stores or things that we can also have our Hong Kong food, like street food, like siu mai something like that, at least, at very least, and then we can also have some exhibition about Hong Kong culture, language, and our differences with Chinese, very explicitly. Yeah. And in that way, we're trying to get ourselves as a community, connecting people in that area, but at the same time, we also want to promote the differences about Hong Kong and the importance of our identity mm-hmm. in a way that it's easier, it's not stressful, and it's fun, it's food, yeah. lovely food. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I think, I don't know if this is a, an issue you've encountered as well, but when you're connecting with the the average person, not like politicians, or people who are arguably more well-informed, uh, they seem to just sort of group China and Hong Kong and Taiwan together, mm-hmm. and it's really hard to separate those three. Mm-hmm. So cultural events um, could be done in, we were talking about, in conjunction with like the Taiwanese uh, mission, for example, mm. just so that people could see the differences between these diff- these uh, mm. these uh, cultures. Is that something that you've come across before? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know other got something similar ideas before, but I heard that uh, in New York City, uh, in Switzerland, in London, 
and maybe many different cities. Yeah, they got something similar. Yeah, for example, in London, uh, there is a is a friend of mine who who has just uh, started a cafe business. Yeah, although it's still under renovation, but they they have rent a two floor uh, cafe. Yeah, and uh, they they want to use the basement for different community. Event like uh, sharing, screening of Hong Kong movie, and then uh, on the ground floor would be used for um, yeah for 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 daily yeah business yeah operation like uh, selling coffee, uh, playing Hong Kong music, uh, in the background in the background, and then yeah so they could do different community events using it as a base mm. to gather different Hong Kongers, and I think that I I don't know the demographic of uh, of. Sweden, I maybe in Stockholm and Gothenburg or maybe in Malmo. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe in either one, in either of these cities, then we could start a cafe. Or maybe if we could set up something like that uh, in Malmo, then we could even draw those people from Copenhagen yeah. to to that area. And it's a good idea. Maybe a focal point. Uh, among the northern countries, yeah. Although also is a little bit far away from, from <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah, but at least two con- two cities and two countries, yeah. Mm. And at least we got a uh, space that um, many different people could exchange their ideas. So uh, yeah, another experience is that uh, not not starting a business, but actually someone has started a business you know, in the UK already. Although it's a li- little bit far away, uh, or actually is between two major cities. But in that uh, cafe, it is called Cafe uh, 1998. Uh, the reason why they name it as a uh, Cafe 1998 is that they want to take care for those who were born after 1997. Mm. And then in that cafe, they got two floors. Uh, the first floor or the ground floor is the um, cafe or the restaurant itself. There were so many, uh, how to say, manchun or promotional material or even a yellow helmet. Uh, gas mask, these sort of things, yeah, or even some drawings from twenty nineteen, yeah, putting, you know, on, yeah, on the wall, yeah, and and all over the, the restaurant, and then the second floor uh, is that they call a bookstore, in which they would show, uh, they would sell Hong Kong books, yeah, it could be history, it could be a, children's book, it could be a. Maybe even comics, or even something related to Hong Kong food, like siu mai. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 there is a book called Hong Kong siu mai. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. So they, they, they saw this sort of books, and then I would say that it create a good synergy. Yeah. So yeah, I, I highly encourage uh, someone to do so in Sweden. And next time I could get some Hong Kong food. <laughs> <laughs> So for a lot of these ideas, for any of these ideas, the funding tends to be a bit of a problem, especially if you're if you've no background in activism, if you're if you're not attached to some big association or, or organization. What is the best um, method of crowdfunding that you've found in the movement? Well, best way. I think it's uh, to be honest, it's getting more and more difficult, especially because the the next chief ex- chief executive of Hong Kong, or maybe uh, Tan Beng Ke, Chris Tan, well, he he had proposed to to prohibit mm. uh, crowdfunding. So I would say that the possibility of uh, having successful crowdfunding is getting more and more slim. And we have to think of other ways to to get the financial resources among ourselves. And one of the way maybe is to do business or to expand the idea of a yellow economic circle. So, uh, so last month uh, we, I I would say we are witnessing the formation of yellow, yellow economic circle in the UK. It was the first time that uh, different so called yellow business shops or shops, uh, they may be. Uh, a bookstore, they may be a cafe, they may be a, a beauty shop, yeah. maybe something um, like a Chinese medicine, this sort of thing. They all group together to provide some kind of uh, discount yeah, to some people. Yeah. And perhaps if we could, uh, if 
uh, there could be some kind of uh, yellow business uh, in Sweden, in Denmark, in Switzerland, in Belgium, in Germany, and then perhaps we could form a so-called international uh, economic circle. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we could uh, try to gather our resources. To be honest, I don't have any practical solution how to tackle the upcoming uh, legislation. So we need to think about that. Yeah, yeah. And what are your thoughts on just the, de the development right now in Hong Kong and the whole chief executive's situation with John Lee being the only candidate? <laughs> well, it's not election, it's selection. So, <laughs> uh, and I would say that the choice of the choice of uh, the next chief executive, it doesn't really matter because we know that Hong Kong is being directly controlled by, by Beijing. Yeah. Although uh, with the rise of Johnny, then we could foresee more brutal suppression. But in general, we are going into the same bad direction. So I don't think there will be much more difference. Yeah. Maybe he will try to do even much more to arrest more people, uh, but then I don't really see the difference at all. Mm. Yeah. So we have to prepare for the worst, yeah, no matter whether it's uh, mentally or physically. Mm. Do you think, and this could be a coincidence, but do you think that has anything to do with uh, all this development? Uh, has any relation to? the new PLA commander in Hong Kong, who used to be uh, an enforcer in, Xin, in Xinjiang. Yeah, that could be, yeah, this is a symbolic move. Yeah, because yeah, for those people who may read, may not read uh, this news, is that uh, the previous commander uh, in Xinjiang, who is responsible for the Uyghur genocide, complicit of the Uyghur genocide, uh, has relocated to Hong Kong to become the commander of the uh, People's Liberation Army (PLA), and well, this could be yeah, a sign that uh, the Hong Kong government is listening to that guy, and that's why recently we got uh, the news of uh, having the so the so-called the radicalization program. Yeah, they, they force different prisoners. Uh, especially the younger one to to receive a uh, so-called education, uh, to receive the right ra the radicalization program, yeah, to re-educate them. So it is something similar uh, to what they have been doing or what they have done in Tibet and East Turkestan. Yeah, yeah. And how do you for you know uh, for Swedes, for example, who? may not have any experience with Hong Kong directly. How do you explain to them the, the relationship that the chief executive has to Beijing? Is this just like a simple puppet figure or is there something more to that? If, if for example, John Lee wasn't the only candidate and if there was someone a little milder, would that make a difference at all? No, it would, wouldn't make any difference because uh, ultimately they report to, to Beijing and well, how to how to let them? Maybe uh, we could we would think that uh, the chief executive is equivalent to to a PM of Sweden, and then uh, well, in in Sweden or in other democratic country, we got a uh, universal suffrage, uh, one man one foot. But in Hong Kong, we don't have such a privilege. Uh, we got a so-called election committee, which is fully nominated uh, by the Beijing regime. So we don't have the right to vote. First of all, this is the difference. And then the second thing is that uh, you can't imagine that uh, in Sweden, uh, the, the PM is being uh, chosen or elected by, or maybe indirectly elected by uh, just 1,000 1, people. Yeah. So this is something that is uh, totally ridiculous and this is not democracy at all. Because in Sweden, at least we got indirect democracy. We choose the MPs, and then the MPs, uh, they are directly responsible uh, to their voters. Yeah. But in Hong Kong, uh, those MPs, uh, Hong Kong MPs, they can't choose. Uh, they can't influence you know, the choice of PM. Yeah. So yeah. So that's this fundamental difference. And then worse still, uh, I I think that the Swedish couldn't imagine that 
even though maybe there is a Swedish PM being elected. And then this Swedish MP, uh, PM has to report to Xi Jinping. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, this is a situ- situation in Hong Kong. Yeah. yeah. So, well, yeah, so this is the sad situation. Mm. Yeah. And is there anything that you think the international communi- community can do um, around this election? Does it, you know, is it worth um, condemning or raising it? The voices against the. Well, uh, to be very honest, we have so many condemning statements um, for years, but we neck the concrete actions. So I would rather say that uh, to make things changing, to facilitate changes, we may rather make use of this opportunity uh, to push for something, something more. Yeah, for example, uh, for the upcoming uh, selection in May, then uh, apart from issuing a statement condemning the this Chinese Communist Party or the Hong Kong government, perhaps they could some of the de- democratic countries and some of the government they may say that okay, we are now considering or we will push for individual sanctions over individuals who conflict. Of or complicit of the brutal suppression of the 2019 Hong Kong movement, mm-hmm. yeah, I would say that it will, this will be much more meaningful. Yeah, but at least, uh, well, I hope that at least there will be some kind of statement. Yeah, if there is, if we don't even have a statement, then I will be a little bit disappointed. Mm-hmm. After all, uh, Hong Kong used to be a member of the international community, and if we uh, forget. Uh, Hong Kong, uh, if we forget the painful lesson of Hong Kongers, then the world sooner or later will repeat the same mistake that Hong Kongers have made before. Yeah. Yeah, because for the last, uh, maybe since 1960s, Hong Kongers have been trying so hard to do business uh, with the Chinese uh, government yeah. or, maybe, or maybe with the Chinese market. But in the end, with more resources, China simply become more assertive, more aggressive, and more suppressive. Yeah. So this is something that uh, the world should learn from Hong Kong. Mm.